Well, good morning. Welcome to you and welcome to those at home who have gathered to uh, watch us online this morning. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, it is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's great to see so many people here. This is awesome. Uh, thank you for coming and worshiping God. And it is our prayer today that you will come and worship God from the bottom of your heart, not just to go through the motions. Uh, we just prayed in the deacons uh, with the deacons just a moment ago to pray that God will, will really move us this morning. And I hope that you're gathering this morning with that purpose in sight. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, actually, we have a few announcements this morning, so I beg your patience to begin with our service this morning. Uh, just a reminder, the annual business meeting is next Saturday at 10 a.m. Uh, the Zoom link will be sent out. It's also meeting live, so it's a hybrid style. You're welcome to come and hear what God has been doing all through 2021 and uh, what he'll be looking forward to doing in this year that uh, we've already started up. So please join us for that meeting. Immediately following the meeting is a, a town hall meeting to discuss our relationship with CBOQ with the question before us whether we're going to stay or go. And uh, there's a lot of information we'd like to pass on to you as deacons and pastor um, and pastors, actually. Uh, and so we need to uh, encourage you to stay and be a part of that meeting after the business meeting. Uh, if you're uh, watching the business meeting on Zoom, we'll send out the Zoom link as well so that you can stay focused in on that meeting as well. But it's a town hall meeting to discuss and to gather information. Uh, we also want to let you know that next Saturday, boy, next weekend's going to be busy. Next Saturday, the coldest night of the year, we've got a team that is uh, walking uh, for the refuge uh, for the coldest night of the year. Uh, we have a team called HRBC Ya, yeah, and uh, we'll be walking 5K or maybe 10. I don't know, what do you think? Two or five, we can go 10. Anyway, we're going to walk uh, next week, and I thank you for those who've already supported us. Um, you can join our team still if you'd like to come for the walk with us. Or if you want to at least support us in prayer, you can as well. And there's a link in the bulletin with more information. Sports Club will be starting up again in just nine days. And we are thankful. We already have a new signee that happened this week. Uh, a friend of a friend who's coming. So we're just thankful for how this is spreading. And we want to thank God for the gospel that is being shared in this. So on March the 1st, we are starting up again with Sports Club. And there's information on the table out there for anybody who's interested. Maybe a grandchild or a neighbor or whatever. Uh, Bible studies are up and running again, too, uh, and uh, some of them have been online for a while, but the Bible study is meeting here on Wednesday nights. There's also the ladies' Bible study on Wednesday mornings, and I want to also let you know that uh, starting on Tuesday, there will be a Bible study starting up again Tuesday, March the 1st uh, at 7 p.m. at Bruce Baker's. There was uh, a few people that would gather uh, in and out on, at Bruce's place for many months, uh, and so that is starting up again on March the 1st at Bruce Baker's. Uh, and also, we want to let you know that um, Children's Church is starting up again next Sunday, and it'll be during service, and it'll be for basically ages kindergarten up to grade six, and if you have a couple, in, a couple of kids in grade seven and eight or whatever, you want them to help lead it, that's a possibility too, but it's uh, going to happen during service, and it's from kindergarten to grade six, so uh, Junior Church, which is kind of amalgamation of junior church and Sunday school will be happening starting next week. That's a lot. Hope you've taken it all in. Uh, but let's not lose our focus this morning on those details, and let's just hear from God's word. I remember years ago, uh, Steve Moss introduced a song to us called Ascribe to the Lord. Almighty ones, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. And that came right out of Psalm 29. Let me just read that to you. Ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The word ascribe means to give honor to God who alone is worthy of receiving the honor. So this morning, that is what we're here to do. We're here to give honor to God. He's the only one who is worthy of the honor, of the prayers that are being said, of the words that are being sung, of the scriptures. He is the only one worthy. And let's remind ourselves of that this morning as we gather in his name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, God, that you give us this, this pause in our week. Lord, where we can set aside ourselves and set aside our time for you. My prayer, Lord, is that it's not the only pause in our week for you. Uh, God, that we would have many throughout the week, but we are gathered here today and we are gathered online, Lord, in your name and for your purpose. 
So, Lord, our prayer this morning is that as we give you honor and glory and strength, God, that you will speak to us. Lord, you will move in our hearts and in our lives in a way that we will be changed because of your presence in us. Lord, help us to focus on you. Help us to think of you as the only one deserving our praise and worship today. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Worship team. Good morning. Let's uh, stand together and praise God through some music this morning. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene And wonder how he could love me A sinner condemned unclean How marvelous, how wonderful And my song shall ever be How marvelous, how wonderful Is my Savior's love for took my sins and my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. Sing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for something glory his face i at last shall see it will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me sing how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Ble blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior and happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Oh, 
sing this song, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me, which I believe we've sung here before a few times, um, but this will just be a time of reflection as we prepare our hearts um, for God's word, and please feel free to sing along with us. Yeah. 
gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and balanced pleas to this I hold my hope is only Jesus for my life is wholly bound to his oh how strange and divine I can sing all this mighty yet not I but through Christ in me the night is dark but I am not forsaken For by my side The Savior, He will stay I labor on In weakness and rejoice For in my need His power is displayed To this I hold My shepherd will defend been one and I shall overcome yet not I but through Christ in me no fate I dread no fate I dread I know I am forgiven my future sure and it has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my part and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this i hold my sin has been defeated jesus now and ever is my plea oh, the chains are released i can sing i am free through Christ in me with every breath I long to follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day oh, I know he will renew me until I stand Jesus, we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you that um, through you, um, our sin is defeated. Lord, that we do not have to worry. We don't have to, um, yeah, we can just, you know, surrender ourselves to you. Lord, and I just thank you for, um, yeah, who you are, that you are a God who is um, present and all-powerful, all-knowing, Lord. And we just want to um, give all the glory and honor to you. I pray, Lord, that your message would go forth this morning um, in a powerful and uh, life-changing way. Um, Lord, I just pray for Pastor Dave as he as he brings your message. Lord, that he would, um, yeah, hide behind your your cross, Lord, and that um, Jesus would be what is um, just so evident. Um, yeah, we love you, Lord, and we just thank you for this time. Um, we thank you that we have the freedom to be here and to to raise our voices for you. Um, Lord, and we pray we would just hold that dearly. Um, yeah.
Amen. Good morning, everyone. I was thinking this morning what kind of a week we really had with, um, with COVID, with daily concerns, with the issues happening in Ottawa, with potential war in the Ukraine. And just the stresses on our daily lives. And then earlier, we hear the sound of a young baby fussing, just making noise, nothing terrible. Parents are probably concerned because it's in the middle of church, but no, <laughs> nobody else is. But then you think God is in control. That's new life. That's renewal. That's hope. And that baby is dependent on their parents. Just like we are dependent on God. So please, bow your head and pray, for, pray with me today. And let's lift our hearts and our thoughts to God and glorify his name. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this new day that you've given us. And there are just so many ways that you do show us that while so many negative things can be happening in our lives, there is always positive. There is always renewal. And you are speaking to us through all of this. And you show us that you are in control. And Father, there are so many things that we are thankful for. We thank you just for the opportunity that you have given us through your word, that we have your word, we have the Bible, we have your thoughts. Thank you, Lord, and we thank you so much that your word is throughout the world. For our own people in our church who have had successes this year. For Eric and the successful procedure that he had. And we think of also the tireless working of our healthcare workers who continually work throughout this pandemic. And there are people who step up on a daily basis. Think of all of the police that have had to go into Ottawa and those police as as a unit, moving the people out of there successfully without, without any serious problems, with extreme control and taking over and bringing back Parliament Hill. And we thank you, Lord, just for their, their fortitude, their courage, and their patience. And we thank you so much that among us we have prayer warriors that constantly, constantly support our church, support the church worldwide. And we thank you, Father. We thank you so much. But then, Lord, we do have a lot of concerns and hurting and illnesses that we need your help with. Steve is going to go under a procedure for a new bypass. We pray, Father, that you would guide the surgeons and just help them, help everything to go well with the surgery. Protect Steve and comfort his family through all of this. Help Steve to recover quickly. Hanny's dad is back in the hospital again, and there are some con concerns for him. He's back in CCU, so we ask you for your prayers. Lay your healing hand upon him, and again, give comfort to Hanny and the family. We think of people in our church who are suffering from 
cancer. Janet and Bill and, and other people, Morgan, just so many people that have cancer concerns and are struggling with that, that it's a continuous fight. And again, Lord, we ask for your healing hand on them and support and, and, and help for the families. We are coming through this pandemic and things are reopening. Lord, help us to be responsible as we kind of go out there and enjoy, enjoy life a bit more. We have an opportunity with a new housing development across the road. Help us to offer that community a service. Help us to be meaningful to them. Help us to really show them what your love is and how much your love means to us all. And we pray for leaders among us, for our government leaders, our municipal, our provincial leaders, within our own church, our pastoral search committee. We think also we have this question coming up over the CBOQ. Lord, we need guidance in all of those areas and with all of those people involved. Please guide us and help everybody to just seek you in the ministries they hold. We always, always, always bring to you our families and our marriages and the concerns each of us have. Marriage is holy. Protect it, Lord. Protect our families. And we think of also the ministries that we support here. Father, help us to remember the different ministries. Help us to be giving to them. And we pray that we would just be um, helpful to each and every one of the ministries that we support. And finally, Lord, there are many among us that are shut-ins. We pray that we as a family can reach out and touch them and contact them and just be show that we are a family to those that are shut in. And we pray, Father, too, that you would just help them to feel your presence and to know that they are really part of your church. And Lord, we offer up all of these prayers to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, John, for leading our prayer ministry this morning. Good morning. <sighs> Great to, to see you all again and to be uh, in the Lord's house this morning. And for those who are watching online, uh, welcome. And uh, we pray that everybody has their Bibles or has their devices and are ready to turn to Scripture this morning. I'll be reading out of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, just a few verses. I'm going to be referring to Acts chapter 2 and 4 later on as well. Um, if you want to keep your finger in the, in the pages, but Romans chapter 1. I'll be reading verses 1 to 5. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures regarding his son Jesus, who has to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and for his name's sake, we received grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. And God's bless his word to us this morning. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, and as we look more into your word this morning, I pray, Lord, that your spirit will move among us will speak to us, God, uh, individually where we need to hear from you. We know you're able, Lord. 
We pray as John prayed that our stubbornness would be removed and that, Lord, we would hear your voice and we would be obedient to your voice. Thank you for this privilege and honor we have today to look at your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this morning, I, I want to speak on the idea of faith and conviction. Uh, back a few years ago, we uh, used to host, back when we could meet in, in homes more freely, uh, we would host uh, Super Bowl parties at uh, Lisa and my house in the basement. And uh, so a bunch of the youth would gather there, and we would have their Super Bowl party. And it was an excuse to get together and to, you know, invite friends and all that stuff. And I remember one year, one of uh, Morgan's friends came, and I don't, wanna, I don't even know if I know his name anymore, but he came because he came and he was very proud to show that he had flashed his card that showed that he was an ordained minister. Now, I was pretty impressed. He was a teenage kid in high school that is ordained. And then he revealed to me that he was ordained of the, of the a Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monsters. It's a real thing. And he became an ordained minister with the Flying Spaghetti Monster Church which is quite interesting to think about. I don't know what he had to do to become ordained. Certainly didn't have to go through uh, school like my brother and I did for years. <laughs> um, but interesting. And it just kind of reflected on that this week as I was thinking about belief. Because, you know, these days, just about anybody will believe in just about anything. We can see people who will gather for any reason to support almost any cause anywhere. It's, it's very interesting to look at that actually I think in the human nature there's a desire for belief in something, in someone. And you see it when people will just gather behind anything, whether it's flying spaghetti monsters or whatever you have. People will believe in just about anything. And when you talk to people on the streets or in classrooms or in your neighborhoods or in your families, they might equate faith with uh, this kind of Believing in something is better than not believing in anything at all, right? And, and yet, that is not scriptural faith. The, the Bible describes faith... Guys, if I can have the slides. Uh, oh, I do have the slides. I just don't have the slides. The Bible describes faith as being complete trust in someone or something. Complete trust. And yet, when you talk to so many people today, they say, oh yeah, I believe in God, but their life doesn't reflect anything about that. There is no complete trust. It's just... This belief, it's this mental assent to something about God or something about a higher power. But there is no complete trust that you see in many people today when they use the word faith. But the biblical definition is complete trust or confidence in someone or something, and more specifically, in God. Complete trust in God. That is biblical faith. Conviction is a, a very specific uh, belief about uh, that comes from our faith, a very specific held belief that comes from our faith. So where biblical faith calls us to do something about it, a uh, conviction calls us to a specific action because of an element of that faith. Um, you know, for example, in James chapter 2, uh, when they were talking uh, about faith and deeds, and James is describing that biblical faith is active, and if you're not active because of your faith, then basically your faith is dead. Uh, you know, he says, even the demons believe that there is one God. That's, they, they, even they have that belief, that understanding of God, but their life is not a life of conviction as to who God is. It, it's, it's faith without action. In other words, he says, it's meaningless. Conviction is a firmly held specific belief. And an example of this uh, Jesus loves all people. He dies for our sin, right? He died for our sin. Uh, he hung on the cross. He went through incredible torture physically, but spiritually as well. Uh, he went through incredible, taking on the weight of the sin of the world onto his shoulders. And this is how much he shows us he loves us. So we are to go in love, right? Specifically, we need to be convicted of Jesus' love in the way that we love our neighbors, right? In the way that we love other people, in the way that we love our enemies. We are to love because that is a conviction that comes from knowing Jesus' love for us. 
So from faith to conviction, I just want to remind us this morning of the importance of biblical faith and the conviction that comes from it. We see Paul, we see Paul in his conviction, uh, we see Paul in his conviction uh, uh, from the time actually when he was born, he was a man of conviction. In Acts chapter 7, uh, and if you want to flip to the right a few chapters, Acts chapter 7, sorry, to the left a couple of chapters, Acts chapter 7, uh, in your Bibles, you'll read the following things, that at the, at the death of Stephen, where Stephen is being stoned, uh, and Paul is there, and it says, and while they were stoning Stephen, verse 59, while they were stoning Stephen, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he fell on his knees, and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. His final act. And when he had said this, he passed, he fell asleep. And Saul, who became Paul, was there, giving approval to his death. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered through Judea and through Samaria. And godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Saul was a very convicting man. <laughs> He, he had a strong conviction. It wasn't a good conviction about the Lord and about the Lord's leading at this point in his life, but he had strong conviction. He had zeal. He was zealous. In Philippians chapter 3, we read that he was a, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He did all the right things. He was a Pharisee. He was a leader. He was respected by all people. Paul lived a very convicting lifestyle. And early on, his conviction was to destroy the church. But then when we get to Romans chapter 5, we see how that all changes. And we see, sorry, Romans chapter 1 verse 5, we see all that changes, that he is now a servant of Christ. He is called to be an apostle. He is set apart for the gospel of God. How can this happen? Except by the grace of God, he says. God's grace moves in Paul's life in unexpected ways, calling the least likely of people to share conviction of Jesus Christ with other people, and yet God uses Paul. He is set apart for the gospel of God. Amazing how God works. It's amazing how God works. He is set apart. He's convicted of who Jesus finally is, and he is set apart for the gospel of God. We can see Paul's conviction in so many different ways, and it kind of led me back to thinking about the early church and how that early church, and I'm just still amazed at what happened with the early church, just the, the, the amount of people that were coming to know the Lord on a daily basis, just the way that the believers lived. I, I really struggle with it because I feel sometimes, uh, somehow today, even I and other believers, we've wandered far from what the original early church looked like. We don't have that same conviction that was so evident in those early believers. Uh, remember, uh, remember, Paul wrote most of his letters to the churches from prison. He was being persecuted. He was chained to a, a guard, a sentry. He was uh, not able to go on any missionary journeys anymore, but yet he still wrote to the churches and he encouraged them to follow and to believe and trust and, and commit their lives to Jesus and to trust him, being convicted that Jesus died for their sin. And I somehow think that today we are lacking so much of this in our, in our churches. When I look at the early church, I just recognize some elements of their conviction Things that we see in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the scriptures. And first of all, we see how the early church was great at releasing things that were held on to. In Acts chapter 2, if you flip back to the left again, Acts chapter 2, we see starting in verse 44, Acts chapter 2, verse 44. We see there that there's this amazing thing that happens, that all the believers were together, and they had everything in common. <laughs> you can't find a Baptist today that has everything in common with another Baptist. <laughs> but they had everything in common today, in that day. 
And it says, and all the believers were together and had everything in common. They were selling their possessions and goods. They gave to everyone as they had need. It's like, wow, they actually did that. And it's, and it's verified and even more specified in a couple of chapters to the right in Acts chapter 4. Where in chapter 4, verse 32 to 35, it says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. Again, that unity is amazing. And no one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. And to go into the specifics of everything, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord. And he was upon them, and there was no one needy who was among them. From time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them. And they bought, brought the money from the sales of their homes and their lands and they put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone as they had need. That early believing church was phenomenal in their conviction that God would provide. They sold their homes, their lands, they sold their possessions like they were nothing because they saw the need of their brothers and sisters. It was an amazing conviction that was a sign of their trust in the Lord. And that is why that early church, I believe, was so powerfully used by God as they were willing to, they were convicted by the fact that God was their God and he would take care of them. Releasing things to God is so, is so very important. Imagine today, just think about it, in your neighborhood. If you put a for sale sign out on the front of your lawn, I hope that you have a good relationship with your neighbors. <laughs> I trust you do. It's a good witness. It's a good place to start with your neighbors. And if you put a for sale sign on the front lawn of your house, wouldn't you expect that some of your neighbors would come over and like, hey, what's going on? What's, how come you're selling? What's going on? Is there a problem? Is there... You would hope to have this opportunity. This open door would happen because of your willingness to let go of your house or your land, to let it go. And somebody would come and say, why are you doing this? And you'd have that beautiful moment to be able to say, I am doing this because my brothers and my sisters that I know who are believers have this need, and I need to meet that need. I have the ability. You know what kind of impact that would have on our neighbors that would go way beyond maybe the years of living next door to them would have? If we were to say to our neighbors, we are giving up all that we have worked so hard for, all that we are entitled to because of our hard work, all the things that we have the right to own here, we release it to God and allow it because our brothers and sisters are in need. Do you not think that our neighbors would remember that for the rest of their lives? How powerful that would be. What a great witness that would be. Now, I'm not saying that we need to all go out and do that today because even in Acts chapter 4, it said from time to time, people would do these things, but the willingness, the, the, the conviction of saying, my brother, sister's in need, I need to do everything possible, everything that I have. This is what happened back then. And it happened back then because these believers were so connected to the life of Jesus, who in Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 to 20, he recalls the cost of following him, that he gave up his rights. He said in verse 20 of Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, he says, Foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Wow. This is the creator of the universe, of the galaxies, the one who gives life to everything on our planet that we observe today and sustains that life, and he didn't have a place to put his head. He didn't have a home to call his own. He didn't claim any of that, even though he could have. He could have made a fabulous palace in a heartbeat, in a flick of his fingers. He could have made this one, but he didn't. He chose to let go of anything in order that people would be convicted of his selfishness, selflessness, and would follow him. What is it for us that we need to release I trust me, we, we all have things that we need to release before the Lord. We all have things that we hold on to tightly. There's things that we need to let go of. Maybe it's not houses and lands, but it could be sin. We need to let go of sin. 
Uh, it could be a relationship that we have, a connection with somebody. We need to learn how to let go of that and, and leave it in the hands of the Lord. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's maybe it is stuff. Maybe it's materialism. Maybe it's having the latest of the latest devices or whatever. What do we need to release to the Lord to show that we are convinced and convicted that He will take care of us? What does our church need to do to be a church that is convicted of the Lord providing for us? What do we need to do as a church? How convicted are we that we are willing to release anything? Would we be willing to let go of our property, our building? Would we be willing to put a for sale sign on the front lawn if we knew that it was going to help people into the kingdom? What are we convicted of? It sounds bad when I say that, doesn't it? it? Makes it sound like we're breaking the law. <laughs> but it is. It's kind of the breaking the law of the modern world. It's, it's letting go of the things that so many people hold so dearly. How much more of a witness would we have in this world if we learn to let go of the things that we hold on to? We need to release things to the Lord, to be people who are living a life of conviction for the Lord. The second thing I think we see in this uh, section of, uh, of the early church is how they held on to the essentials. They held on to the essentials. If you go back to Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 to 43, you see this beautiful demonstration of what they were living for, how they were so devoted, how they were convinced of who God is. In verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled in awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were being done by the apostles. They devoted themselves to the word of God, to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to it. It wasn't just a, a nice thing that I can pick up occasionally and, and listen to. They devoted themselves to it. They learned and studied and wrestled and talked and lived. And to prayer. <laughs> they were a people of constant prayer. They were praying for each other. You could just tell. They were devoted to prayer. They were devoted to the fellowship. And by the way, fellowship with each other can only happen if we first have fellowship with God, right? First John. We can only have fellowship with one another if we are in a right fellowship with God. That is a clear biblical teaching. So just because we show up on a Sunday or any other day of the week and we're around other Christians doesn't mean we're having fellowship. We could be gathering with unholy and unhealthy lives and there's not fellowship happening if we're just gathering for the point of getting together with each other. Fellowship first has to happen with the Lord and then it happens with other believers. They were committed to that fellowship. They were committed to the breaking of bread, sitting down at the table, remembering the life of Jesus. In Romans chapter 1, verse 5, going back to... Um, Going back to the, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, verse 5, it's a powerful verse. Through him, through Jesus, and for his name's sake, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles. And what are we calling them to? To the obedience that comes from faith. It's this wonderful purpose that is there, holding on to the essentials of the gospel of Jesus Christ and getting it out to people. Last week, uh, the Super Bowl took place. I caught, uh, Lisa and I caught the uh, halftime show in the last half of the game. I think Lisa bailed after the halftime show, actually. Um, and, and we watched it. I'm not a big football. That's the most football I've watched all season. I feel bad for Rich and all those guys because I can't talk or anybody else. I can't talk about football, Bill. I mean, I, But I do know this story that happened as a result of last week's L.A. Rams Super Bowl win. Uh, there is a young man... I think there's a picture. Beautiful. There's a guy. You probably don't know him. He is Marquise Copeland. He is number 95 on the LA Rams. He's a defensive tackle. He is a massive man, six foot two, 280 pounds. That's big. He looks very friendly up there in that picture, but I wouldn't want to be hit by him. He... Um, 
In 2019, he was signed by the Rams, and then they waived him later on in the season. They put him on the practice squad. In 2020, he was signed again. They waived him. They put him on the practice side. In 2021, they waived him. They, they, uh, they, they signed him. They waived him. They put him on the practice Three years in a row, this man didn't know if he was ever going to play consistently for this team, and he actually did not play in the Super Bowl game last week. Um, but he did play in the wild card game a few weeks before that. But the story about Marquise Copeland is not about his ability to play football, but it's his ability to be there at all because when his mom, Tanisha Copeland, was pregnant with this man, she experienced such pressure from her family and her friends to end the life, to abort him. And she experienced so much pressure to do so that she ended up in hospital with uh, clinical depression because as a teenager, nobody believed that this man would ever live to, to be provided for or cared for. And so Tanisha Copeland, against all of that pressure with her conviction that this was a life that was committed and given to her by the Lord, she attended after she was released from hospital, she attended Open Door Maternity Home in Ohio, which is a residential ministry for pregnant teens. And there she learned how to trust Jesus that he would provide for her and for her not yet born son. And she drew so close to Jesus that she held on to the essential thing of her life that God had given her, which is this young man who becomes now wearing a Super Bowl ring. Now, we shouldn't be impressed that he's wearing a Super Bowl ring because what we should really be impressed with is the fact that he's alive because of this mother's conviction. In our world today, we are so overwhelmed by a lack of conviction. There are so few people that are convicted about so many things. People just do whatever they want. Maybe that's the conviction. We're driven by whatever we want in this world. But here we see that this early church and Paul were driven by unity and it says in verse 5, the obedience, if I can have, next slide, guys, sorry. The obedience that comes from, uh, the obedience that comes from faith. And it's, some, it's an essential that was held on to through the word of God, through prayer, through fellowship, breaking of bread. They were enjoying the favor of all people because they were so committed to the Lord. They were holding on to the essential things. And today I wonder how many of our churches are holding on to the essential things, holding on to the right understanding of God's word rather than manipulating the words of God to make it more appealing to the world or to themselves. How many other people are, uh, how many of our churches are committed to prayer? I know Harmony is committed to prayer because we've experienced it in our own life. And I know people are saying all the time, we are praying, we are praying. I know that. But I'm afraid that so many of our churches today have lost this devotion to prayer. So many churches today have lost the devotion to the beauty of this fellowship that we have, brothers and sisters gathering together to celebrate who Jesus is in our lives. And how many of us are, are, our churches today are not convicted of all these things that are so essential to our faith? We need to pray for our churches. We need to pray that there will be a new rising up within our churches and stop blaming the world because we've just embraced what the world is doing. We need, to, you know, we need to be convicted so much of who God is that we're willing to do anything for him. Conviction is seen in releasing things to God. Conviction is seen in holding on the essential things of God. And finally, conviction is seen in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love this. Back to uh, Acts. I'm sorry we're bouncing around all over the place, but back to Acts chapter 4. <laughs> You just got to pick that out in Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 13. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, Paul, or sorry, um, uh, uh, Peter and, and uh, Jonathan are making this great, um, they're, they're making this, these great statements to the religious leaders who have arrested them. And it is Peter who says salvation, in verse 12 actually, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Powerful statement. 
And when the people saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that they were just ordinary, unschooled men. And they were astonished. And look what they did. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. It's, it's almost lost because we're so amazed at, at what happens before. But people took note that these men, Peter and John, were connected closely to Jesus Christ. It was because of their courage. It was because of their boldness in proclaiming Jesus. And he is the only way to salvation. It is because of that boldness that these men were drawn to this person and they said, he is connected to Jesus. (laughs) It's real conviction. And I love what happens later on in chapter 4. After uh, Stephen and John come before all the leadership and they get, you know, basically it's like a trial and they're, you know, they're questioned about all their, you know, you can't do this. They're told you can't do this. You can't keep going and talking about Jesus. And they say, we're going to do it because it's right. You know, that's bottom line what they said. And they, and they release them because they don't know what else to do. And when they release them, look at what the believers do in chapter 4, verse 29. It's beautiful. Um, Now, Lord, consider their threats, the threats of the people, and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. I love it. They're facing all this persecution. They've been arrested. They're possibly facing jail time. And they're still saying, this is the right thing to say. This is the right thing to do. And when they get released back to their, their fellow believers, they're praying Now God continue to give them the boldness that's going to get them into trouble again. That's what they're praying. They're not praying, oh, thank you, Lord, for protecting them, and, you know, you guys take a break and all that. No, no, they're praying, go back with more boldness. They're praying for more and more. In Romans chapter 1, in verses 1 to 5, we see this great heritage that you and I celebrate. As Paul describes The gospel, he says in verse 2, the gospel of God which he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures, revealing his son as to his human nature was a descendant of David, but who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection of the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. That is who we believe. That is who we trust in the one who God has given power to, the one who God sacrificed for our sin, the one who has been proclaimed since the beginning of time that his time would come and has come, and we have witnessed that. That is who we believe in. (laughs) Thanks, Adam. That is who we believe in, and the question is, are we really convicted of who Jesus is? Are we really convicted in our own lives of who Jesus is? Do we really believe this? And my prayer is, I hope we really do. This past week, I had a couple of visits uh, that had a huge impact on my life. And I'm so thankful for visiting with people. Because uh, most of the time, you go thinking that you're going to be some kind of a blessing to people. And you walk away thinking, oh, I'm I'm so proud. Um, And I'm so blessed by meeting people. I had a visit this week with uh, uh, a couple of men. And uh, I was so impacted because this one person um, will welcome anybody into their house so that they can talk about who Jesus is. I just love it. Somebody knocks on their door trying to sell some home security device or sell something else. Come on in, have a seat. You know, can I get you something to drink? And it's like, what? You don't do that. But this person does it because they know as soon as they come in, they have an opportunity to share who Jesus is. He shared, uh, this man shared with us this week that there was a young man who came in to his house and as they were talking, the young man said, I have never heard about this Jesus. I have never heard about this. Nobody my age hears about this anymore. I had another visit with a couple who had been married for over 60 years. And defying the odds of what a lot of people say, marriage has always ended in divorce. No, this couple have been married for over 60 years. They defy the odds. 
And for an hour and a half, I sat and listened to them telling about how the Lord has provided for them over those 60 years together. How they have served him faithfully and God has provided for them faithfully. Because that is who Jesus is. He provides for us. And they are convicted about that. And they live a life of conviction. And they live a life of serving the Lord because these people are courageous people. In a world today where Nothing stays the same, and everything is so changing. These people have committed themselves, and the Lord has blessed and provided for them. They are courageous people, just like Paul, just like Peter, just like John, who are courageous people going out and sharing the gospel. We need more of this conviction in our day. We need our churches to be more convicted of this need, that we need to release things to God, that we need to hold on to the essentials of God's word and prayer and fellowship and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ regardless of the cost. We need more of this. We need more of this. It's interesting that at the end of their great courage in Acts chapter 4, this prayer, at the end of this great prayer, that they would have more courage to go and share. And there was just this sense. And what happens? The meeting place, the place in which they were meeting in was shaken because it was filled with the Holy Spirit as they prayed that God would increase their courage and their desire to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lives were shaken. Community was shaken. Buildings were shaken because of their conviction. Will we share that same conviction? I pray we will. I pray we will. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word today. God, I just thank you for the lives of these believers who lived many, many years ago, Lord. I just thank you for the lives of of those who have committed themselves, and not just one foot in, one foot out commitment, Lord, but fully committed themselves to, to you. I thank you for their example. I thank you for their courage and their... And God, I thank you for the empowerment that you gave them because it is through your grace and mercy that you call them and you call us to be apostles. God, I thank you for them. I thank you for for being the one who gave them this conviction, this courage, when, when they could have easily tossed it in. Father, create in us, I pray, as believers, as a church, create in us this conviction that we will hang on to Jesus with everything that we have, that we'll release anything that was in the way of that relationship, Lord, that we will commit ourselves to you and to your purpose. And that we will not, Lord, settle for anything but your best. And we will not follow anybody else, Lord, but we will be obedient to the faith that we have in you, Lord. I thank you, God, for this. And I pray, Lord, you will move among our church, you move among our churches, Lord, you'll move among our lives, God, to draw us closer to you in this. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Worship team, will you come back up? stand with us for this last Mm. let's praise God praise God from whom all blessings flow praise him again. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye the Praise for
Bow your heads and receive this blessing from God's word. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have this great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. And having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Heavenly Father, may we live for you this day and this week. May you empower us by your word and convict us, Lord, by your spirit and lead us into your path Lord, that we will be prepared for every decision we make, Lord, this week to honor who you are so that when people see us, Lord, and see the way that we are living, they will take note and they will see that we are in a relationship with you, Jesus. God, display in us your holiness this week, we pray in his name. Amen.